NVIDIA ANNOUNCED ITS NEW line, LINE OF AI PROCESSORS. THE CEO, JENSEN WONG, ANNOUNCING THE NEW ARCHITECTURE. IT'S DUBBED RUBIN, AND THAT COMES AHEAD OF THE COMPUTIX TECH CONFERENCE THAT'S BEING HELD IN TAIPEI. NVIDIA SHARES THIS MORNING UP 2.7% uh, FOR THE YEAR, UP 186%. JOINING US RIGHT NOW TO TAKE A CLOSER LOOK AT THE AI LANDSCAPE IS APURV AGRAWAL. HE IS A PARTNER AT ALTIMETER. And Apoor, let's talk a little about what we've seen with NVIDIA. You, you have a way of describing this. This is very different than what we saw in cloud computing. This is the semiconductors that are making all of the money at this point. But there is a, a pyramid that's stacked on top of that. Becky, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Um, Jensen giving us a preview of Rubin is a clear commitment to their move from a two-year product cycle to a one-year product cycle, right? We saw Ampere series move to Hopper in 22, and then Hopper moved to Blackwell now in 2024. And going, expect, going forward, we expect them to be on a one-year cycle, which is in lockstep with their customers, right? There's two customer segments that I see for NVIDIA, right? One, you've got the cloud hyperscalers, and they have taken their CapEx up from 140 billion last year to now 200 billion this year. And that growth of 40%, most of that is coming from their investments in building accelerated computing in their data centers. And secondly, we're seeing a lot of startups um, and their product release cycles, as we have seen with OpenAI's chat GPT that you and I and our listeners have had the opportunity to use. They were on the three, GPT 3.5 two years ago. They went to GPT 4 last year and now 4.0 as of a couple of weeks ago. And so we are seeing this move from NVIDIA as a, as a, as a real way to be in lockstep uh, with their customers. So are the valuations in the entire AI universe at this point frothy or not? Look, uh, this is something we talk about every day. Are AI valuations frothy? Definitely. Uh, the questions that I ask are two questions. Is it worth the hype? Is the sizzle worth the stake? And second, uh, how do we navigate that? Uh, and look, they are frothy. However, they are definitely worth the hype because AI will create a lot of value. There are two truths that are true at the same time right now. AI will create a lot of value, but it's also not clear where that value will accrue. Uh, as our founder and CEO, Brad Gerson, reminds us, look, in, in the internet era, you could have invested in Alta Vista and Lycos and Ask Jeeves and a dozen of these search startups that were born before Google came out, and you'd have gotten that right. You'd be right about the internet. You'd be right about search. Unfortunately, you'd have picked the wrong player. Investing in the Google IPO in 2004 would have delivered 90% of all the search results. And that's a little bit of what we are seeing in AI right now. And look, this is not unexpected, right? We, we, we've seen this in the internet, we've seen this in the cloud. And so the, so the, so the big question that we ask is, how do we navigate this? And what's the answer? Well, we are navigating this with, with, with caution. There are two places where we see a lot of opportunity, obviously, you know, there's a picks and shovel side of this where we've been invested in businesses such as NVIDIA um, and the, on the semiconductor layer. On the hyperscaler layer, we are invested in businesses like Azure and AWS and, and, and CoreVive on the private side. And those are picks and shovels that everybody's using. On the application side, it's, we, are, we are proceeding with a lot more caution. Uh, the biggest question that we ask, we ask is, are these revenues in startups that we are seeing, are they experimental uh, or are they truly recurring, ERR versus ARR? And there's a couple of areas that we've seen incredible, incredible value. You know, I'll give you an example of a space that we're deep in customer service, right? It's a huge area of spend, $450 billion spent on humans answering phone calls every day. It's a tough job. Sometimes those customers are angry. AI can help, a combination of small models and large models, delivering reliable empathy all day long, solving more than half of all the calls coming in. And we've backed a company in the space called Parloa um, that, are that is helping large enterprise customers, working with the hyperscalers, customers like Lululemon, uh, where you don't need to punch in the number, you don't need to be waiting online anymore, and you get a human-like response quickly. What's the name of the company again? The company is called Parloa. How do you spell that? I'm not familiar with it. Oh, it's spelled as P-A-R-L-O-A. Uh, okay. I mean, I can understand in a situation like customer service, because if you can actually, uh, you know, turn it over to machines and not have humans that you're paying for this, I can understand how that could get to the bottom line very quickly. The question is, is it good enough? Because I get really mad when I get sent into customer service hell, where you can't get out of this loop and you're dealing with what you know is a computer or, you know, some, some cyclical uh, level that you're never going to get out and get to a human. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd welcome all your listeners and you to try it out on their website. Uh, you can get a demo of it on Parloa. You can call it and see how it feels. It's, it, it delivers reliable empathy. Uh, you know, it's a combination of small and large language models that understand the reason you're calling, where you're calling in from. And so we save a lot of the work that you would have done otherwise. Typically today, you're greeted with, hey, punch a number to call for a rep or punch a number to call for returns. And, you know, we've skipped all of that uh, with latest advancements in generative AI. All right. Um, beyond that, when you start trying to figure things out, is it safe to say that you're being very choosy <coughs> about where you would place bets outside of the big infrastructure plays? Definitely. Definitely. We've been make, we, while we've been making investments, we've been very cautious. There's a couple of areas, as I mentioned, customer services one. The other area that we're studying deeply is uh, coding AI. You know, as a developer, I'm certainly much more productive using GitHub Copilot now than I was uh, not using Copilot. And that's another area we see incredible value uh, being created. What is a little bit less clear is how that value gets captured outside of big tech with Microsoft making great advancements uh, in the space. Um, Apoor, when you look around, I mean, we know that venture capital is often a place where when you start getting into a frenzied environment, uh, the due diligence is, is much lighter. You, it has to be because it's like trying to buy a house in a hot housing market. You, you don't get a chance to necessarily uh, do your inspection or another buyer will come in and snap it up. Is that what it feels like right now? You know, there's certainly some element of that. We've got some startups raising at 50 to 100 times revenue, deal processes moving fast, uh, where in, in the same time where public software is valued at four to six times forward revenue. However, as you know, Buffett says, you know, when, when things speed up, uh, we're slowing down. And you know, most of the investments we've made in the space have been in, in startups where we had a chance to evaluate them over months, even before the investments have happened. Uh, it is certainly the zeitgeist right now, though, um, and one that we're proceeding with a lot of caution.